I would like to request today that you find the moment, an extra moment, and pray for one another. For tonight's message will be followed by an appeal to the hearts of those who want to surrender completely to God. I'm going to make two appeals simultaneously. One to those who are not Christians and want to become Christians by faith. Another to those who have backslidden and reproached the Lord. I've talked to some of you who were baptized as children without really having experienced that individual, personal relationship with the Lord. Pray about it today. Tonight's message I consider climactic. And it is one that I use everywhere I go if I'm going to stay a week. Oh, there are many versions of it. But basically the same thing. And I've already told several that tonight's message will answer the questions that they've brought to me in the council room. It won't be the most profound thing you've ever heard, but certainly most practical. Last night, we talked about Methuselah. This morning, Mephibosheth. An interesting story with a lesson for all of us, I believe. We begin with a conflict chronicled in the Bible. A young and gifted soldier, chosen of God, a reluctant warrior whose tactics were defensive rather than aggressive, constantly on the move with his men, keeping himself alive by laying hard on the providences of God, fleeing from the threat of his own king. The intrepid David Bar Jesse, sustained by a loving God and the devotion of Prince Jonathan, aware of his destiny yet dreading its portent. And then came the gory carnage at Gilboa where a king and his sons fell in battle. And now it was known and accepted throughout Israel that David would become king. When the news of Saul's death reached the palace, a court nurse panicked and fearing a Davidic vendetta and a bloodbath at Jerusalem, raced into the nursery and picked up the son of Prince Jonathan to flee with him to a place called Lodibar in order that his life might be spared in the scourge she anticipated. Now, in her horrible excitement, she dropped the child, perhaps on the marble steps of the palace, and his feet were permanently injured. Can you possibly imagine the sudden humiliation of a child who is not only now bereft of his princely heritage, but, but must grow up a miserable cripple as well. More than 16 years pass, when one day nostalgia conquers David and provokes a splendid magnanimity. And we read in 2 Samuel 9, beginning with verse 1, And David said, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on both his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Then King David sent and fetched him. What a story. And this story illustrates the grace of God. And at the same time, the pitiful predicament of millions of misguided people. 
crippled from infancy, lame from the fall, every one of us, spiritually crippled from the fall in Eden. We are full of weakness, sickness. These things are ours because of the fall. And you know, I have felt a kind of pity as I have been privileged to talk and pray with young people this week. They come in and sit before me, some of them, as though they are so ashamed, as though I couldn't possibly understand. Don't you know that I know what it means to struggle against sin and weakness? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the only possible way I can look you straight in the eye and preach a straight message is because of the blood of the Lamb. I know what it means to struggle hard against a thing and to seem almost beaten down by it. You don't have to shed tears in my presence, of all people. Or if you knew my past, I'd have to drop my head. The lame prince was virtually in hiding. This is indicated by the fact that David had to make the kind of inquiry which he did. After all of those years, he hadn't heard a word about a survivor of Saul's household. On the other hand, Mephibosheth dreaded the very name of David. Dreaded his presence. I can imagine that if the king were traveling near his hometown, he wanted to go somewhere else to get away from the very proximity of the king. He was the king's enemy because of his relationship to Saul. He didn't know how David felt about Jonathan. Consequently, he was hiding from his best friend. And of all places on earth, he was at Lodibar. And if you look in the back of your Bible, that, that name is interpreted, place without pasture. Or as one other writer put it, the place of no bread. The place without provision. In the Bible, there are many towns, the names of which begin with the prefix Beth, and Beth means house of. Bethel, Beth, house of El, a contraction of Elohim, house of God. This is none other than the gate to heaven in the house of God, Bethel. Then there was Bethsaida, house of fish, a little town by the lake of Gennesaret, from whence Peter and Andrew came, the fishermen, the house of fish. There was Bethany, the house of hospitality, the house of dates, the house of fruit, where Christ loved to go and spend his leisure with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And perhaps the most famous of all was Bethlehem, and this was David's town, and it means house of bread, house of plenty, and it's appropriately named, named for out of it came the bread of life, the Son of God himself. David, Bethlehem, house of provision, and Mephibosheth was at Lodabar, the place without pasture, the house of no bread, a lame, crippled prince in a dry and fruitless land, the house of poverty, the far country, destitute and helpless. And the tragedy is compounded by the weary years rolling by in darkness with no prospect of things getting any better, no hope. Mephibosheth had accepted his plight. A basket made of reeds, a bed by the way. Then to fish coins out of the dust that were thrown in contempt to a miserable cripple that nobody wanted to be bothered with. Oh, the loneliness of sin. There's a lot of difference between pleasure and joy. 
A lot of difference between excitement and happiness. You can go on your binge and enter your little forbidden place, and you can laugh loud to try to drown out the howling fears that cry within. But when you're back on campus and the lights are out, there is a storm in the breast that will not let you rest. There is nothing quite like the loneliness of sin. In all of my family, big family, I have one sister who has forsaken the Lord. And my heart breaks for her. The loneliness of sin. Whenever she sees me, she cries. And she thinks I don't love her. You don't come to see me. And I do all of that. I'm not her problem. There is a void that even I can't feel. The loneliness of sin. The pathetic plight of Mephibosheth. In my town, there are dozens of former Adventists, young people that I went to school with. And sometimes I meet them on the street, and I'm glad to see them. And they seem almost proud to say to me very quickly, you know, I don't go to church anymore, and I wonder if they're bragging or complaining. And if I know them well, I have no mercy. I said, is that so? Well, tell me why. What profit? What good thing has happened to you since you gave up the church? Maybe I want to give it up. Tempt me. Are you suddenly rich because you gave it up? Are you healthier? The answer is in my eyes. They look about ten years older than I do. What have you got? Trouble. Problems. There is no bread in Lodibar. The way of the transgressor is hard. The devil tries to convince us that if we serve the Lord, we're going to have it hard. <laughs> the way of the transgressor is hard. I've got some pretty good camera equipment, you know, and one day a friend of mine picked up one of my cameras, and it is expensive, and he said to me, Charles, how in the world can you afford a camera like that on your salary? I said, I use my liquor money. <laughs> and I buy film with my cigarette money. 250 bucks a year for cigarettes, you can buy a lot with that. The way of the transgressor is hard. It is empty. Wretched and miserable. And this was the plight of Mephibosheth, hiding from his best friend, scared of the approach of the king, dreading any word from him, fearful of the king's coming. But he is sought by the king. The Bible story is clear. It was not a matter of Mephibosheth seeking David. It was the other way around. And wherein do you suppose that Christianity differs from all other religions that are and have ever been and shall be. It is in this, in other religions, men are always extending themselves in search of their God, but in our faith, God's looking for us. The hound of heaven tracking us down, following us around, and when the devil would like to smash us in order to claim us for eternity, angels fend off devils, and God says, not yet, not yet, I'll wait a little longer, I'll try again, I will persist after him. Man wants nothing to do with God. He runs from his presence, he has always done it, Ever since the first sin, after Eve sewed together the first miniskirts of fig leaves and then dodged behind the virtue of Eden to hide from God, man has been doing it ever since. It is the God of the Christian who seeks man. Mephibosheth's name means shame. A fallen prince, born to the purple, predestined to wear a crown. Now he lives in shame, crippled, awkward in appearance, grotesque in his stride. Living in shame, his shame is impersonal because what he suffers is a part of the retributive judgment of God against Saul. He had nothing to do with that. 
but it's also personal because of the way he looks and the way he moves. We try every trick we can to dismiss our own guilt. What kind of God is he who would punish me for what Adam and Eve did? I had nothing to do with that. That's true. You had nothing to do with Adam and Eve failing. But it's also true that the second Adam came and succeeded where the first failed, and you had nothing to do with that either. Long before you were thought about, Adam and Eve plunged us into this mess, and long before you were thought about, Jesus made a way out. You've got a personal responsibility, and don't you ever forget it. Your shame is impersonal, for all have sinned. But your shame is very personal when you resist salvation. And the man who dies will die for his own sins. Through whatever the mechanics of self-justification are, Mephibosheth triggered his thinking and conditioned his mind into self-delusion. He convinced himself that his plight wasn't so bad after all. Certainly it wasn't his fault. As a matter of fact, he could blame it on the nurse, the establishment. She was over 30. Like some who blame their parents because they are bullheaded. I'd like to be by when you tell the Lord that in the judgment. The spirit of prophecy says God delivers from both inherited and developed tendencies to evil. And so Mephibosheth is a type of the countless young people today, bewildered, confused, let down, misunderstood, yes, and abused by some of the older folks. I try to be balanced in my thinking about this. I listen to some of the older people excoriating the young, and I look them in the eye and tell them, you did the same thing when you were young, and the only reason you're not doing it now is because you're too old. Yet he was running from his one true friend, hiding. Couldn't even see he needed help. And David said, go with a message from me and fetch Mephibosheth. Go with a message from me and fetch him from Lodabar. I don't want him down there. I want him here with me. God told me that, like Ziba, go and tell these young people, lame though they be, crippled and weak, invalid, go tell them to come out of Lodabar, the dry and fruitless place, where there is no peace and no happiness. Go tell them to come. But don't make it easy for them by lowering the standard. There are those who are not comfortable with the Bible. They condemn it because it condemns them. And folks are down on what they're not up on. And so they are trying today to forget it. And they want a new Bible, one that makes them comfortable. And there are powerful denominations that are working on one like that. They want a Bible which they say is more relevant to the people. I've got a newspaper clipping in my Bible here where a bishop met in convention with a powerful group of ministers and suggested our Bible is not relevant. He said, as a matter of fact, wine and unleavened bread have no relevancy today. What we need to do is serve soft drink and hamburgers for Holy Communion. Blasphemy. Go and tell my young people that I'm calling them up to a high standard. But tell them that I will supply the power if they are crippled. I will supply the strength if they're lame. The United States spent $24 billion to put a few very special, select, well-qualified men on the moon. They didn't spend five cents to try to bring the moon down here so that ordinary common folks could trample on it. God's standards are high. Jesus spent the gold of his blood and the silver of his tears to make a way that we might ascend to excellence. The standard will not be brought down to where we are comfortable with it. My burden is not to change the word to fit men, but that men might be changed to fit the word. Go to Lodabar and get these young folks, said the Lord. Go get them! 
I want to fetch them. I want to bring them into my banquet table. God sits on his throne, as David did so long ago, wishing desperately to show kindness to the house of Saul for Jonathan's sake. And he asks, as David did, is there yet anyone of the house of Satan to whom I can show kindness for Jesus' sake? And I want you to pass the word. Some young people turn off older folks. So those of you who know the Lord, pass the word. God is willing to show kindness for Jesus' sake. Tell your roommate that. Tell the fellow that that's bitter. Who won't come to the council room. Tell him. Pass the word. Tonight the invitation will come. Anybody, anybody, lame, grotesque, awkward, I'll show kindness for Jesus' sake. Pass the word. Pass the word. Infirmity, a weakness you don't seem to have any power to overcome, I will show kindness for Jesus' sake. Deformity, I'll straighten it out. For Jesus' sake. And when you read down to verse 7, when Mephibosheth came to the court, he must have felt a terrible excitement. And David said unto him, Fear not. You've come to me crying. Could hardly get started. Ashamed. Pastor, I don't know how to begin, you've said to me. The message from the king is, fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. I will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Isn't that a beautiful ending to this story? Fear not. I will show thee kindness for Jonathan's sake. I will show thee kindness for Jesus' sake. And all the land that belonged to your father saw a difference now. I will give back to you. The devil usurped authority here and took over the world. Even Jesus called him the prince of this world. But Christ, like David, has confiscated his land, and he's going to give it to those who come to his banquet table. The meat shall inherit the earth. And you're going to eat bread at my table continually, all the days of your life. You're going to be treated like my own sons, crippled, deformed. I'm going to cover that up with a robe of a prince. And if you don't want folk to see you walking so that they remember your weakness, you may sit on a throne. You're going to be one of my sons for the rest of your life. And when Mephibosheth saw what he was, he understood what the king was. And he called himself a dead dog. There was a great preacher once, John B. Garth, who had a terrible history. He had been a wretched alcoholic. He had gone to the bottom. But through the mystery of grace, he was redeemed. And he wanted to give his life to God as a preacher, and he became a Great man of God turning thousands to the cross. And in New England, there was a woman whose son was an alcoholic. A disgrace to the family, hopelessly fettered and bound by his habit. Finally, one day, he crossed the line 
of his father's patience. And the father said to the mother, he must leave this house. I can't take it any longer. I disown and dis- disclaim him. He's got to go. But you know, there's no love like a mother's love. Spirit of prophecy says it's the only love that comes close to approximating the love of God on earth. I've told some young girls this week, women are lovers, not men. Mrs. White says that even when you're married, it's your privilege to soften and subdue and refine your husband. Women are the true lovers. That's why they're so vulnerable. Why they get hurt so often. And the mother broke into tears, pleaded with her husband, caught a hold to the very hem of his coat and would not let go until finally for her sake the father said well what can we do what can we do the mother said look there's a chicken house in the back of the place here I'll fix it up I'll make him a room and I'll look after him you don't have to come in contact with him and the mother went out and fixed up a chicken coop and put a bed in it and a table and her son was put in there And when he was out of control, a lock was fastened. And that mother toiled and labored with that son day after day. And finally she read that John B. Garth, the former alcoholic, was coming to preach in that town. And so, with a heart beating in prayer, faith and anticipation, she made her way to the meeting. There was a vast audience and a great sermon and a marvelous response. And when it was all over, Dr. Garth busied himself with greeting and saluting the people who came to honor him, tired and weary. Finally, it was all over and he was ready to go and he saw that woman sitting in the audience. And something said to him, there is a problem here. The great preacher in his weariness strode toward her. And said, Mother, may I help you? And she told him a story. And with tears streaming down her face, she said, Dr. Goff, you've got to go to my home. If God could do for you what he did, maybe, maybe you can reach my son. And because he remembered his past, in spite of his fatigue, he had to respond. When he got to the house, the mother pointed him to the chicken coop. And then waited and prayed as he raised the latch and went inside, only to be railed upon by a young man drowning in alcohol. Profanity such as he had not heard for a long, long time. He tried to reason with him, tried to talk with him, only to be insulted by the profanity that rolled from the lips of this wretch. Finally, he thought, this case is worse than mine was. I can't help him. He backed towards the door and walked outside and dropped the latch and started back towards the house. And when he looked ahead, he saw tender hands cupped at the window, the face of that mother peering out towards the chicken coop, and he decided, I've got to try again. But I've got to have a tactic. I don't want to hear all that abuse. I'd better take the floor and keep it. And so Dr. Garth opened the door, and before the young man could speak, he fairly shouted at him, Do you believe in God? No, I don't believe in God, he said, and he embellished it with certain little words. The great preacher shouted back again, Do you believe in Jesus? No, I don't believe in him. And he fixed it up a little bit. And then the preacher shouted a third time, Do you believe in love? He knew what that was. A puny little old mama taught him what that was. Even through his liquor, he knew he didn't deserve her attention. He knew what love was when father was yet ready to throw him out. He knew what love was when his face was bathed as he lay wallowing in his own filth, he knew what love was. 
There was a pause. And then he dropped his head. He said, yes, yes, I believe in love. And with that, Dr. Garth fell down on his knees, raised his eyes toward heaven, and he cried, Oh, love, come into this place. Oh, love, with power come to this miserable boy. Oh, love, with victory come to him who is bound. Oh, love, with freedom come to him who is enslaved. And the young man's mind was clearing. He didn't get it. So he shook the preacher. He said, who are you talking to? You asked me if I believed in God. I said, no. You asked me if I believed in Christ. I said, no. But now you're praying to love. Who is that? The preacher said, why, son, God is love. God is love. Not vengeance. Not chastisement. Not condemnation. God is love. And it dawned on the darkened, soggy intellect of that young man. God is love. He slammed his last bottle to the floor and dropped down into the widening pool and said, Love, save me. Love, help me. God, is love. Not a cop. Not a sheriff. He's love. Stand for prayer. Oh, love. Touch every heart today with thy affection. Satan will walk beside many to convince them to even miss tonight's service, or at any rate, not to respond to the appeal of love. Resist and rebuke him, I beg in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Cassette Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright American Cassette Ministries, all rights reserved. To order CDs or audio cassettes of this or other presentations, or for a free catalog, Please call toll free 1-800-233-4450. International calls, please dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americancassette.org. There you will discover the largest selection of genuine Adventist preaching available. American Cassette Ministries is not a one-man band. It's an orchestra of outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. You can trust ACM. There's no compromise here. If American Cassette Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony. Our email address is info at americancassette.org. We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and financial support are important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. Peace coming soon.